in the beginning, part seven, understanding the when of creation in Genesis one and two. The uh, book we've been studying is entitled, full title, In the Beginning, Science and Scripture Confirm Creation. Although it would probably be better to say Scripture and Science Confirm Creation. Uh, that's the jacket of the book itself. Um, it's written by Brian Ball, who has an uh, interesting career. He's uh, born in Devon, England, got his MA in Religion from Andrews, got his PhD from the University of London. He's been a church pastor, evangelist, uh, conference president in the North England Conference, then went to Avondale, where he met many of the other people that are writing, but not uh, this one. And then has become president of the South Pacific Division, is married to Don, and, he, and uh, they have three children. Uh, the book itself is written from a perspective that views scripture as decisive, as the uh, introduction says, its authority takes precedence over all other sources of information concerning origins. Uh, therefore, it spends a lot of time, probably about two-thirds of the book is on theology, various kinds of theology. And um, then it does include some science, and we're going to get to that eventually, including uh, our own Ariel Roth, who's written a chapter there. And uh, it also deals with uh, trying to compromise the, the two stands, the standard scientific model and, uh, and uh, creationism and uh, also evolutionary mor morality. Um, this chapter is written by Richard Davidson, uh, who got his BA right here in Loma Linda University. Um, actually, I think that was probably during the time when La Sierra was part of Loma Linda, and so he actually got his from La Sierra. Um, so uh, I guess that answers the question of whether any good thing can come out of La Sierra. Uh, he got his MDiv from Andrews University, his PhD from Andrews University, and uh, he's been teaching at Andrews University since 1979. And since that time, he's become the John and Andrews Professor of Old Testament Interpretation and the department chair of the Old Testament department at Andrews University. And he is married to Joanne. We've read her chapter before. And uh, they have a daughter, Rahel, who is uh, working in graduate degrees in biology and also in theology. So somebody who's got a foot in both camps, and I think that's an excellent idea. John Davidson starts his chapter saying, the basic elements in the Genesis accounts of origin are summarized in the opening verse of the Bible, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, that's the when of origins. God, that's the who of origins. Created, that's the how. And the heavens and the earth, the what of origin. In this chapter, we will concentrate on the first of these elements, the when of creation. I've left the note in here uh, because what he basically says is he's doing this in conscious reply to a couple of the chapters that were written in Understanding Creation. Uh, bearing in mind that the creation accounts of Genesis 1 to 2 emphasize the character of God and that the overarching emphasis in these early chapters of Genesis is undoubtedly not so much upon creation as upon the Creator. It will be argued, however, that a basic understanding of the when of creation can lo be logically and legitimately derived from a careful study of the text itself. Um, the when. In the beginning. In discussing the point of creation, a number of questions arise for which answers may be sought in the biblical text. And he is now outlining what he's going to talk about. Um, so these questions are actually going to be answered in order. Does Genesis 1 to 2 describe an absolute or relative beginning? Does the Genesis account intend to present a literal historical portrayal of origins or is some kind of non-literal interpretation implied in the text? 
Does the biblical text of Genesis 1 describe a single creation event encompassed within the week, creation week? Or is there a prior creation described in Genesis 1-1 with some kind of gap implied between the descriptions of Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-3 and following? And finally, does the Genesis account of origins present a recent beginning, at least for the events described in Genesis 1-3 to 2-3, including life on earth, or does it allow for long ages since creation week? We will look at each of these questions. Number one, an absolute or relative beginning. That depends upon the translation of Genesis 1-1, and there are two major translations or interpretations. Uh, there's an independent clause in the beginning. Um, for clarity, anywhere where I have added stuff, um, I put it in yellow so that you can pick it out. Uh, there, or there's a dependent clause, when God began. And the difference it makes is, does matter exist before the creation of the heavens and the earth? And he goes on to say, when the word Bereshit occurs elsewhere in scripture as a construct in a dependent clause, it is always followed by an absolute noun with which it is in construct, not a finite verb as in Genesis 1.1. Genesis 1 1, remember it's Bereshit bara Elohim. The verb is next. Whereas it's in the beginning of the reign of King so and so, for example. Um, whenever it's uh, the construct, it needs to have a noun behind it. This one has a verb. That doesn't make good Hebrew grammar otherwise. Syntactically, Umberto Casuto. Uh, points out that if Genesis 1-1 were a dependent clause, the Hebrew of Genesis 1-2 would have normally either omitted the verb altogether or placed the verb before the subject. The syntactical construction that begins Genesis 1-2 with uh, wow and plus a noun, the earth, um, indicates that, quote, that verse 2 begins a new subject, end quote, and Quote, therefore, that the first verse is an independent sentence, or as we would put it, an independent clause. The traditional translation as an independent clause conforms to the pattern of brief terse sentences throughout the first chapter of Genesis of the Bible. And basically, if you read the chapters, it's all very simple sentence structure. And it makes more sense to have a simple sentence at the beginning as well. The account of creation throughout Genesis 1 emphasizes the absolute transcendence of God over matter, kind of implying uh, that uh, a creation of God, of, by God of matter itself would be appropriate in this point. Um, the God, matter was created out of nothing other than God's will. All the ancient versions, Septuagint, Vulgate, Symmachus, Aquila, Theodosian, Targum, Onkelos, the Samaritan transliteration, Syriac, Vulgate, etc. And if you did a double take with the Vulgate there twice, I did a double take too. It's in the text. I'm, obviously, somebody wasn't quite uh, good enough with the red pen when this was written. Um, Render Genesis 1-1 as an independent clause. But there's quite a list there. And it's not complete, as you notice, etc. And finally, there is a parallel with John 1, verse 1. And there, it is clearly uh, an independent clause. In the beginning was the word, not in the beginning of whatever. The dependent clause theory is largely based on ancient Near Eastern parallel creation stories. You may remember the Enuma Elish, when on high. That's a dependent clause. 
But there is no ancient Near Eastern creation story that starts with a word like beginning. Uh, Genesis 2 parallel is imprecise for partly the same reason. It isn't, uh, there isn't a, uh, in the beginning. Uh, furthermore, the use of Mereshit from the beginning without the article, but clearly in the absolute in Isaiah 46.10 shows that Bereshit does not need the article to be in the absolute which is one of the things that has been alleged as a reason for translating in the beginning of or when God began to create. Here in the opening verse of the Bible, and this is his summary of that particular discussion, we have a dis distancing from the cosmology of the ancient Near East, an emphasis upon an absolute beginning in contrast to the cyclical view of the reality in the ancient Near East and in contrast to the ancient Near East view that matter is eternal. In other words, God created, among other things, matter. Next question that he deals with is a literal or non-literal beginning. Now, this is the importance of what he is saying. Without a literal beginning, Protology. There is no literal end, eschatology. Furthermore, that is, the second coming is dependent on creation. Um, furthermore, it may be argued that the doctrines of humanity, sin, salvation, judgment, Sabbath, and so on, presented already in the opening chapters of Genesis, all hinge upon a literal interpretation of origins. Um, Now that's the importance, but of course that will not determine what the Hebrew meant. That just says that uh, if you go one way, it's going to have considerable consequences for your theology. First, the literary genre of Genesis 1 to 11 points to the literal historical nature of the creation account. The biblical creation stories are not poetry, but prose narratives. Second, the literary structure of Genesis as a, whole, as a whole indicates the intended literal nature of the creation narratives. Remember the word toledot in the generations of is a traditional uh, translation, but probably more accurately the story of, uh, is all the way through Genesis. Well, it's all the way through Genesis 1 through 11, including right between Genesis 1 and 2. And that seems to indicate that, that this is all as literal as Abraham was intended to be literal. The phrase evening and morning appearing at the con conclusion of each of the six days of creation is used by the author to clearly define the nature of the days of creation as literal 24-hour days. Again, the occurrence of Yom day at the conclusion of each of the six days of creation in Genesis 1 are all connected with a numeric adjective, and a comparison with occurrences of the term elsewhere in scripture reveals that such usage always re refers to literal days. The Sabbath commandment seems to indicate that it was intended to be literal. Um, he <laughs> says, <laughs> And I quote, evidence not mentioned here for lack of space, although he does have uh, footnotes that will guide you there if you want to read uh, some more of the evidence. And he, no he notes that Jesus himself refers to Genesis, uh, to, that should be Genesis, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. And, and all 11 chapters of Genesis are referred to in the New Testament. While the non-literal interpretations of biblical origins must be rejected in what they deny, namely the literal historical nature of the Genesis accounts, and nevertheless they have an element of truth in what they affirm. Um, however, the parallelism of days in Genesis 1 is not a literary artifice created by the human author, but is explicitly designed as part of the successive creation, creative acts of God himself, 
who as the master designer created aesthetically. Uh, Concordist Alvin Platinga, some of you may know him from uh, uh, philosophy, Christian philosophy, uh, collects samples of uh, statements of critical scholars that say what Genesis actually meant, even though they don't believe that Genesis describes reality. And uh, one of them that pops up is that of Julius Wellhausen, who said, this is obviously translated from the German, he undoubtedly wants to depict faithfully the factual course of events in the coming to be of the world. That says the Genesis author. He wants to give a cosmogonic theory. Anyone who denies that is confusing the value of the story for us with the intention of the author. And I think that's an important point. And then he mentions the quote that, uh, of James Barr that uh, commonly uh, makes the rounds about there's nobody in, in academia who, uh, who's a serious scholar who says that this is, uh, was anything other than an intended to be a literal account. And uh, he quotes one that Alvin Platingo does not collect, and that was uh, Gerhard von Rad. You also argued that even though he didn't believe in the literal uh, uh, truth of Genesis, he did believe that the author who wrote it believed in the literal truth. And John Walton is quoted in, I think, a passage that's really important. Um, when we're approaching this kind of a question, we cannot be content to ask, can the word bear the meaning I would like it to have? We must instead try to determine what the author and the audience would have understood from the usage in the context. With the latter issue before us, it is extremely difficult to conclude that anything other than a 24-hour day was intended. It is not the text that causes people to think otherwise. Only the demands of trying to harmonize with modern science. And I would have to say amen to that comment. In fact, I think John Walton is expressing a general rule in biblical studies that you, your obligation is to try to understand it, not to try to fit it into your theory. Um, then he discusses whether there are multiple or single beginning. Now, that's an interesting title because the title seems to imply single beginning. And yet, as you'll find out, he actually favors a multiple beginning. He talks about the active gap theory. This is sometimes known as the ruin and restoration theory. This is the idea that uh, God created, um, uh, and then the devil took it and ran with it for millions, hundreds of millions, billions of years. And then finally, God said, no, let me show you how it actually works. And the fossil record is that of uh, what the devil has done. Those holding this view translate Genesis 1-2, the earth became without form and void. But um, Davidson's comment on this is the ruin restoration or active gap theory simply cannot stand the test of close grammatical analysis. Genesis 1-2 clearly elevate, uh, contains three noun clauses and the fundamental meaning of noun clauses in Hebrew is something fixed, a state or condition, not a sequence or action. Uh, that's what nouns are about, things that are, that are uh, the way they are. Um, he goes on to talk about the no gap and passive gap theories together and he says, this is the traditional view, having the support of the majority of Jewish and Christian interpreters throughout history. However, there is one crucial aspect in this creation process about which it may not be possible to be dogmatic. This concerns when the absolute beginning of the heavens and the earth in verse 1 occurred, either at the commencement of the seven days of creation or sometime before. 
Several considerations lead me to prefer the passive gap over the no gap theory. First, as John Hartley points out in his uh, NIB commentary, I assume that's a New International Bible, uh, the consistent pattern used for each day of creation tells us that verses 1 to 2 are not an integral part of the first day of creation, verses 3 through 5. That is, these first two verses stand apart from the report of God on the first day of creation. You may remember, as and God said, let there be light and there was light and so forth, and the evening and the morning were the first day, and God said, uh, in the evening and morning with the second day, and God said, in the evening and morning with the third day, and so forth, all the way down through the days of creation. And that implies that day one starts with verse three, and God said. And so one and two are actually prelude. And uh, I would go on to say that that makes a special sense because three, all the way through the end of the chapter, has what is known as the Wow consecutive, or the Vav consecutive, depending on your Hebrew accent, um, where uh, uh, the imperfect is used uh, as a verb behind uh, the uh, Wow, and whenever that happens, the imperfect changes to the perfect uh, tense, and it's the standard way in which narratives are told. For example, the stories about David, or the stories about the Exodus. The stories all the way through the Bible are done with that while consecutive. And, uh, and whenever you see the wow and then a noun and then the verb, it's out of the standard order and it means stop here and think about it. And verse 2 is one of those stop and think about it. It's, it's introducing something kind of from the side. Now is a good translation for that. As in, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was without form and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the water. And there's three nouns that have that wow in front of them. And then it goes on to, and said God which is the standard way of doing it. Actually, if you were being really technical, you'd say, and will say God, uh, with the understanding that it actually means, and God said, but it's in narrative form from then on. Second, the phrase, the heavens and the earth in Genesis 1-1, is most probably to be taken here, as often elsewhere in scripture, as a merism, or merismus, that includes the entire universe. This is not to imply that the writer of Genesis, whom I take as Moses, necessarily understood the nature and extent of the universe in exactly the same way as we do today. And you read that and you're thinking, you know, oh, is he going to say, well, he didn't really know that much? Well, actually, it's the reverse. In fact, he may have known more about some phenomena of the universe than modern science has been able to determine. If Moses also wrote the book of Job, then he knew of other worlds with intelligent life forms. See Job 38, 7. That's the morning stars uh, sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Third, the dyad heavens and earth, the entire universe of Genesis 1, 1, is to be distinguished from the triad heaven, earth, and sea, planet earth's three habitats of Genesis 1, 3 and following and Exodus 20, 11. This means that the creation action of Genesis 1, 1 is outside of or before the six-day creation of Exodus 20, 11 and of Genesis 1, 3 and following. Fourth, the text of Genesis 1, 1 does not indicate how long before creation we, the universe, heavens and earth, was created. And uh, Somebody was mentioning the uh, translation of the Good News Bible, and uh, there he's, he's approving of that translation, the universe. Fifth, already in the creation account of Genesis 1, 3 and following, there is an emphasis upon God's creating by differentiation or separation involving previously created materials. On the second day, God divided what was already present, 
the waters from the waters. On the third day, the dry land appeared, seeming to apply, imply that it was already present under the water, and now you could just see it. And the previously existing earth brought forth vegetation, verses 9 through 12. On the fifth day, the waters brought forth the fish. And on the sixth day, the earth brought forth land creatures, implying God's use of pre-existing elements. This same pattern seems to be true with the creation of the greater and lesser lights of the fourth day and the light of the first day. Sixth, such a two-stage process of creation in Genesis 1, like the work of a potter or art architect, is supported by the complementary creation account of Genesis 2, describing the way God created man and woman. In Genesis 2, 7, it is evident that God began with this previously created ground or clay, and from this formed the man. There's a two-stage process. Form the man, breathe into his nostrils the breath of life. Similarly, in God's creation of the woman, he follows a two-stage process. He puts the man to sleep, takes a rib out, and then he builds the rib. And he also mentions, interestingly, that uh, the forming of the man is the kind of forming that, they, that a potter would make out of clay. It's the standard verb to form. And that when God made the woman, he built her uh, in the same way that a builder would build a house. The uh, construction of both Mosaic Sanctuary and Solomonic Temple took place in two stages. First, they gathered all the materials, and then they worked them into the temple. And of course, if there's sanctuary imagery, then it suggests that uh, something of the same kind of thing could be seen. Genesis 1.1, God created the heavens and the earth, and then the earth needed to be, the matter was there, and it needed to be formed. And so God formed it in six successive days. But... Um, Davidson goes on to say, despite my preference for the passive gap over the no-gap theory, I acknowledge an ambiguity in the Hebrew of Genesis 1, 1 to 2 that does not allow us to be dogmatic in support of either option. So the Bible doesn't have the final answer here. And I think that uh, the best thing to do is to be honest about one's agnosticism. But in either case, whether there is a passive gap or whether there is no gap. The biblical text calls for a short chronology for the creation of life on earth. And then he discusses, finally, a recent or remote beginning. Creation week described in Genesis 1, 3 to 2, 4 was recent. The evidence for this is found primarily in the genealogies of Genesis 5 and 11. A patriarch lived X years and begat a son. After he begat this son, he lived Y more years and then begat more sons and daughters. And all the years of this patriarch were Z years. Uh, in Genesis 5, it's that way all the way through. In Genesis 11, the only difference is the omission of the Z. These tight, interlocking features make it virtually impossible to argue that there are significant generational gaps. Now, he goes on to say, uh, there may be some scribal stuff that took place. Uh, the, the question of the two Canaans, the second Canaan in, uh, in uh, Genesis 11 uh, comes up. So there may be a small amount of uh, wiggle room, but there's not a large amount. Uh, to further substantiate the absence of major gaps in the genealogies of Genesis 5 and 11, the Hebrew grammatical form of the verb begat Yalad in the Hifil, um, used throughout these chapters, is the special causative form that always elsewhere in the Old Testament refers to actual direct physical offspring. That is, biological father-son relationship. And he gives some texts. This is in contrast, and that's my typo, to the use of Yalad in the simple call. I'll call this is a simple hifil is from he caused to make. Um, the verb uh, 
pa'al, uh, pa'al is, um, is the standard verb in Hebrew conjugation when they want to say uh, how you should uh, uh, conjugate verbs, and that's hifil is uh, the, the hifil form of pa'al. The scholarly consensus is that the MT, Masoretic text, has preserved the original fig figures in their purest form, while the Septuagint and Samaritan versions have intentionally schematized the figures for theological reasons. But regardless of which text is chosen, it only represents a difference of about 1,000 years or so. Regarding the chronology from Abraham to the present, there is disagreement among Bible-believing scholars whether the Israelite sojourn in Egypt was 215 or 430 years, and thus, whether to put Abraham in the early 2nd millennium or the late 3rd millennium BC. But other than this minor difference, the basic chronology from Abraham to the present is clear from Scripture, and the total is only some 4,000 plus or minus 2,000 years. Thus, the Bible presents a relatively recent creation of life on earth a few thousand years ago, not hundreds of thousands or millions or billions. In conclusion, um, he has two considerations that he wants to, has to pay attention to. Two considerations, at least, arise from our discussion of the when in, gen in the Genesis creation account. First, the creation account is a powerful witness against accepting the creation week as occupying long ages of indefinite time, as claimed by the proponents of progressive creationism. And second, this re recent creation becomes significant in light of the character of God. A recent creation, he says, is a window into the heart of a loving, compassionate God. And uh, I've omitted some of the stuff that he said because it's going to be repeated in the next uh, paragraph. In the introduction to this chapter, we alluded to the character of God as underlying the Genesis record. Any interpretation of the biblical account of origins must recognize the necessity of remaining faithful to the portrayal of God's character in Genesis as in the rest of Scripture. Interpretations of these chapters that present God as an accomplice, active or passive, in an evolutionary process of survival of the fittest, millions of years of predation prior to the fall of humans, must seriously reckon with how these views impinge upon the character of God. He finishes up, I would argue that perhaps the greatest reason to reject evolution, theistic evolution, or progressive creation is that they malign the character of God, making him responsible for millions of years of death, suffering, natural selection, survival of the fittest, even before sin. Creation and evolution in any form are biblically, theologically, and semantically incompatible. And there he finishes. Now my take on that, I actually uh, find nothing I can disagree with on uh, Dr. Davidson. Um, this fits in well with the defense of the scriptural story of Genesis may remember there is such a thing as propositional revelation. The text is reliable. The word speak for, speaks for itself. That's Joanne Davidson's chapter. Uh, Genesis is theologically sound. There are two chapters arguing that. Genesis is ancient. That's, uh, we discussed that last week. Genesis describes a recent creation. That's this week's discussion. And then we're going to talk about creation and biblical theology, which are mutually supportive. The New Testament supports the Genesis creation, and creation is more compatible with Jesus than evolution. Then we'll discuss scientific arguments. There are five chapters on that. Ethics and theistic evolution. So you can see where this fits in the general plan of the book. Uh, Dr. Davidson, I think, is probably right about the absolute beginning. Um, I've seen people argue otherwise, but uh, the arguments that he makes are, in my opinion, pretty hard to refute. Uh, he is right about the days. He has good arguments about the gaps, and um, I think appropriately leaves it uh, not final. 
is write about the chronal genealogies. They are written as if inviting people to add them up. Um, uh, we will see more on arguments about the character of God, but I think he's right here as well. And uh, in my opinion, I think this is a very well-written chapter, and uh, I will leave it to you guys to do, discuss further uh, what you think now that you've seen the synopsis, and hopefully some of you have actually read the chapter itself. Um, comment here. Okay, uh, I have a question uh, regarding regarding the state the argument that is uh, we cannot accept suffering before sin. Whose sin are we talking about? Adam's sin or Lucifer's sin? Because Dr. Provencia came up with the idea that uh, if we could document without any possibility of doubt that uh, human life and animal life existed longer than 6,000 or 10,000 years, then he said, I would go with the idea that suffering is the result of Lucifer's sin, not Adam's sin. Uh, what do you think? Well, I think that if we were forced into that position, uh, we might have to try to uh, see what we could do about it. Um, I'm not of the opinion that we're forced into that position at this point. Um, and I think also that it's not fair to use that as a criterion to say, what did the Bible mean? Uh, I think that the caution of Julius Wellhausen, uh, Wellhausen is very appropriate that you read the text for what it was intended and that if you disagree with the text, then say, frankly, I don't believe this part of the text, rather than trying to say, well, the text really means what I want it to mean. Because if you try real hard, you can make, for example, days become uh, longer than 24 hours and mean indefinite periods and therefore indefinite periods of millions of years, just so that you can make it fit in with the uh, with the standard theory. Now, I, I mean, I have, you know, if the truth lies elsewhere than what we've always believed, and we, we're going to have to deal with that. And Jack Provencia has made dealings that uh, are probably better than many other dealings, although he has his own problems. Um, I actually addressed that in my chapter in Understanding Creation. Or if you'd prefer to read it in Spanish, it's now out in the Fe y Ciencia. Um, but, um, but I think our first text uh, task is to ask, what does the text actually mean? And then our next task is to ask, you know, do we actually believe it? Uh, but we should never confuse those two questions. And if you're going with the text, the text is clearly implying short age. The text is clearly implying um, uh, a fall. The text is clearly implying a worldwide flood. You put those all together, and uh, uh, until you pick a flaw in the theory and say you don't believe it at that point, um, That particular theological problem is not a problem for somebody who takes the Bible at face value and actually believes it. You don't have to explain that it's the devil's sin. You can, you can blame it all on Adam and Eve. Uh, we have a comment here and then uh, another one over there. Just on the first, first verses of Genesis, um, I was under the impression that it, this, as other Hebrew literature, is in a journalistic style where they, they summarize or state their 
uh, intent at the beginning and then they elucidate, then they um, add details. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth could just be an attempt to summarize what we're going to tell you next and may not be able, we may not be able to get any more meaning than, than that. <laughs> well, you will notice that when Richard Davidson discusses this, he has reasons for thinking that, that God created at the beginning and then he took the earth proper and then formed it in the way he wanted to. Um, but he frankly says that you cannot prove from the text that that's the case. That on the other hand, you can't prove from the text that uh, God formed the earth and immediately within hours or seconds or minutes he created life uh, or light and then started the seven day process. Now one thing I will say is I'm a little bit more cautious. For all I know, the days back then were 24 hours and 50 minutes or something like that. That I don't think bothers me and I don't think it bothers too many other people. Uh, although it bothers a few that they aren't exactly 24 hour days. And my question to them is then, what do you do when we keep adding leap seconds periodically nowadays? Uh, if it has to do with exactly 24-hour days, then we're, we're in trouble already. Uh, but what it has to do with is evening morning days, you know, days when the uh, light comes up and days when the light goes away, or nights when the light goes away, and then the day, next day the sun comes up. Or in our case, it's always the sun. In the first three days, it wasn't. But they were light and dark cycles, uh, regardless of how you look at it. Um, a comment here. I was just wondering here. Um, you know, we're trying to deal with a problem here that the book's dealing with, with this class goes over and over with, and there's some other classes that do the same thing. And that is that the Bible seems to contradict science. So uh, I asked a question a couple of weeks ago, you know, look at Genesis and find out where, what data we actually have in Genesis so we can argue with science. And I guess there's, there's a couple of things. There's the timeline, which, you know, you've been talking about. Yes. It's divided in seven. And then there's emphasis of what was worked on for each one of those days. Right. Those, those you can more or less say, you know, is a, is a kind of a scientific consideration there, even though it doesn't give you too much. But everything uh, else... At least I, I would say not so much scientific because we can't repeat this stuff. But certainly, well, certainly data. I'm talking certainly about data. historical, yeah, yeah. I'm talking about and data, not, ne not necessarily that you can repeat it. But that you could have had recorded it with video camera and everybody would pretty much agree on what was being recorded. Yeah, just just those items though. Yeah. But everything else in gen in Genesis is general. It's general all up and down the the gamut. Um, you can. F it's just a bucket where you could fit all kinds of stuff in. You know, there's not really too much there. So here we are arguing, where, you know, we're arguing on the the platform of science where they've got tons of ammunition. And here we are arguing in theology where we have a couple bullets. There's only about seven bullets. So here we are. It's just, I don't know if our approach is correct or not on this. I'm just wondering what you could say about that. If, well, I, um, would, I would say that our approach is perhaps correct, but not complete. <laughs> A lot not complete because there's just, I mean, you've got a whole universe of stuff we can see with the Hubble telescope with microscopes and all this stuff, and yet we've got a couple pages in the Bible, you know, of couple things. And so how do we deal with that? Well, I, I think that one point that he's making that's important is that... Um, the Hubble telescope is almost totally irrelevant to the questions that we're dealing with. Okay, then, if there then is the problem passive, isn't relevant. If there is a passive gap, mm -hmm. then 
if somebody wants to argue that the universe itself is 13.7 billion years old, uh, we don't have a big theological problem with that. On the other hand, if somebody were to say that the universe is uh, 180 million years old and it's all done by plasma, we don't have a big theological problem with that either. Those are questions to be settled on the basis of how well the data fits the various theories that are being proposed. So the, the big problem is this time, the only scientific piece of data we got out of Genesis is the timeline. And is that's the, the only thing. The timeline for life in particular. Well, the timeline in general, I don't know about life. I mean, it, because it's, it's, it's dividing, uh, there is an emphasis in the timeline. And it's talking about different forms of life being created during that time. Well, not just life, but you know, you've got the, right. the other stuff too. Uh, but it's, it's very general. It's very general. So, I, I mean, I'm not doing this to mock anything. It's just that the, I think the truth is hard-nosed, and I think the Bible can stand by itself. So I'm not scared of, of shaking people's ideas about this because we've got to deal with it somehow. Well, I guess what I would say on that score is that we've spent a lot of time discussing the scientific data. Uh, we went through scientific arguments for creation. We went through scientific arguments against short-age creation. Um, uh, we're going to be discussing the Grand Canyon, which is as scientific as it gets, and nowhere in the Bible that I know of anyway is the Grand Canyon mentioned. So I guess what we're doing here is just trying to get everything squeezed in that timeline. I guess well, that's what we're the trying whole to thing. do is we're trying to say. If you try to understand the Bible on its own basis, mm -hmm. on its own merits, what is the Bible actually saying? And in this particular case, what is Genesis 1 uh, and the early parts of Genesis um, uh, actually saying about, among other things, time? This particular thing is, is about time. And Although I would say that it's useful to try to deal with the scientific questions, and I think that we have done that and we will do more of it. Uh, we have five scientific chapters coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll go over some of the scientific data during, at that point. I'm sure Ariel Roth has plenty of stuff packed in, into his chapter on science, am I, I'm assuming correctly. Um, and. Uh, but this is, a, this is a hiatus from our usual dealing with science per se and, then, and trying to fit it in with Genesis. This is going back to what does Genesis actually say? What, do we have to, what are the parameters that we're dealing with from the biblical record? And while I would say, you know, I would not want to say that that's all we should deal with, but I think it is an important thing that eventually we should deal with. And so that's what we're doing today. Okay, I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Now we have, I think we have one hand way back there, and then uh, here, and then uh, there's more. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, I'll go. Okay. And if then hand it back. If you assume a gap, and you assume the great controversy erupted before the creation week. Can you read into the creation week perhaps a statement by God as an answer to the great controversy on certain aspects? Is there a great, a is there a, is there a great controversy aspect that this fellow apparently hasn't talked about in his book? Well, you know, many people have noticed an implicit polemic and I think that there may be an implicit polemic that's been put there specifically because God wanted to make some points. And one of them is that when he creates life, he does a really nice job. When God created everything, he looked and behold, it was very good. Uh, and God intended 
this to be um, a statement about how he creates. And that very goodness, among other things, uh, the implication is that the animals eat the plants and don't eat each other. And as you go further on down the story, you find where people are given permission to eat animals now. Almost, well, definitely implying that earlier they hadn't been given permission. You know, it gives the diet for the humans and the animals. And so God is saying that no sentient organism is to be regarded as solely a means without being thought of as an end in itself. If you like, that's one of the principles of love. You do unto your neighbor as you would want to be done to if you were in your neighbor's place. So I think there's a, there's a statement being, set, uh, being made there about how the universe ought to run. And in fact, uh, the devil's challenge is, you know, God, I God isn't really the kind of person you can trust, so don't trust him. Uh, do it your own way. And your own way is you've got to take care of number one. The, all this loyalty stuff, that's a bunch of hooey. So I think, yes, there is, there is a, a place where creation is fitting into the, the fundamental question of the great controversy, which is, is there such a thing as love? Yes? And then... Uh, I think you have to begin with the realization, and I'm using Ella White's phrase for this, the Bible is a complete system of philosophy. When you realize that the war that broke out of the war that broke out in heaven came between the creation of the universe and th then there was light I mean God created light that's again her her understanding of it, and it can be seen that way if you look at Genesis and revelation you're having to assume that the Bible's complete and the the philosophy is all there. But you can, you can work backwards from her understanding and her revelation on that. It's not in Genesis, but there's room. Everything fits if you put the entire text of Scripture beginning to end together. I, I think you're right on that. I think that we need to be careful, though, not to say that Genesis 1 clearly teaches this. It only teaches it when you put it in... in uh, the context of the rest of the Bible. Right, you're not going to run out and say Genesis says, you know, exactly, you've got to use the entire word to be able to explain it. That's and right. it's not from a scientific perspective as much as from a large picture view. I mean, if the, if the Bible is description from heaven looking at earth as the theater of the universe, then you can understand what's happening in the rest of Scripture. Uh, yes. In the question posed previously, I, I think that too often I see those trained in the 70s and the 80s to be intimidated by the thought that science has such an overwhelming amount of evidence to disprove creation, when really the over the last 20 years to 30 years, We've almost flipped the data around so that I think we have a preponderance that favors intelligence behind design, favors a, 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 the most logical worldview, has a reason for moral values to exist because there was a creator with moral values, et cetera. So the preponderance of scientific evidence does not favor a random chance or a selection of the fittest or random, random acts occurring. In fact, the data would suggest strongly the other way admitting the fact that we have an issue with the traveling of light over periods of time unless you do a passive gap theory. You have a problem with that. We have issues with radio carbon dating and some others. And there's no question that we have some things that we cannot answer well from a scientific standpoint. But to hold the position that they hold the preponderance of evidence in favor of their position is 
not, I don't think, accurate in this day and age as we go through many things in this class. And it is extremely important because with, once you gut creation and a creator and a fall, you might as well not talk about Christianity. You have no fall, you have no need for a savior, you have no Christology. So you cannot gut the creation issue and the fall and sit here as one of our speakers once before did, who we were covering a book on, and somehow claim that, that you could still going to be a Christian while you've just wiped out the, the fall and the need for a redemptive savior. Well, you can deliberately hold contradictory ideas in your head, but that doesn't make them non-contradictory, and that doesn't make it uh, sensible to do that. Um, and I, I agree with you on that. Um, I should probably note it's getting to be uh, 11.30, and I know some of you have places you have to be. Uh, but uh, uh, we have one comment here, and then one in the back that uh, has The cover article in Discover this month says that it's going to explain where the Earth came from. And it's an interesting article. Uh, some things that I noted that puzzled me was that uh, they're flying around Vesta right now. And by an analysis of the surface of Vesta, they have found that it's the same composition as the meteorites that we have found on Earth. They suggest that the Earth is a composite of various uh, things that resulted from the Big Bang they aggregated together. But there seems to be a difference between the composition of the Earth and other universal objects. Other solar system objects. Other solar yeah. system, as you know. Uh, I'm a little puzzled. Uh, you know, if we take the stand that God created the universe, um, was he just, um, did he like to just vary things? It's not all the same uh, constituent matter. Uh, it, it is interesting. In fact, uh, there is variation in not only elements, but also isotopes. Uh, and, uh, you know, that makes, that makes uh, whatever variations that God decided to make uh, such that we can't even see them until we get scientific enough to, to, do, to use mass spectrometers. Uh, that's, you know, when I, when I grew up in chemistry, one of the things they said was that all matter was always with the same isotopic signature. And uh, it's mostly true. Um, but there are a few variations, and it's, it's fascinating to ask the question why. Uh, and uh, the variations between some things on Earth you can kind of understand because, for example, oxygen-18 water boils at a slightly high higher temperature than oxygen-16 water because it's heavier. The um, same thing was true, deuterium and, and normal hydrogen. Um, but some things are a little bit harder to figure out, and, and you know, one of them is uh, the isotopic uh, composition of meteorites. It's close, but it's not exactly the same. And uh, exactly why that is is not clear. Um, uh, and one can insist, well, there must be a scientific explanation, but maybe there isn't. Maybe that's just the way God likes to, to, to do things. Um, now, I wouldn't want to put that as my first hypothesis because I think that it's, it's fair to look at all the alternatives. But if you run through them all, then uh, at some point it's reasonable to say, well, tentatively it looks like uh, that's the way God wanted it uh, for whatever reasons he has. Uh, maybe just to keep us on our intellectual toes. Now you've been waiting patiently. Thank you. Oh, that's fine. Uh, one of the things I think is so important is the, the statement about Moses. You know, when we talk about Moses, we say, well, you know, back in those days, they believed this and they believed that and so forth. Moses wasn't dependent upon what people believed later on. It was given to him directly by God. And so 
It's the same way with the spirit of prophecy. If we, if we believe it at all, then we can believe that Moses uh, did just exactly like it says in Exodus. That he talked with God face to face. God isn't in the, in the business of confusing people or let them stagger around in the dark. I think that all of these things about what the people believed during Moses' times is irrelevant. Well, uh, actually, uh, I agree with you with the ancient Near East. I think the assumption that Moses uh, simply wrote uh, whatever everybody else thought in the Near East doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but I do believe uh, that, uh, that uh, when you read the text, you read it as if it was written in ordinary, I would say English, but obviously Hebrew, to ordinary Hebrew people who were expected to get certain kinds of information out of it, and it ought to be read that way. And that's one of the reasons why I really have trouble reading the days as long ages. It just doesn't make sense in the passage. Uh, and people who, I mean, I, I think John Walton hit it on the head. He says, you know, you can't ask, well, could it mean what I want it to mean? That's trying to read your prejudices into the text. And I don't think we have any business doing that if we're really trying to understand the text and interpret it correctly. And, you know, at the end we may say, I don't believe the text. I think that's more intellectually honest if you're going to go that way than to say, well, the text really means uh, that, that it's long, uh, long age days instead of regular 24-hour you know, the standard variety days. Uh, to come back to one other, th one other point, and I think this is important, is that if we establish that the biblical account was intended to mean that it's 24-hour days, uh, again, I'm, nobody's going to argue about 23 hours and 57 minutes, you know, um, basic earth turn days. Uh, these were the ordinary days of creation, and the Sabbath was an ordinary day, and that all of this happened with a lineage that is given in Genesis 5 and 11 without significant gaps, and that Abraham lived at a particular historical time, and we'll eventually be able to figure out exactly when that was, and if we had enough detail, we could actually find probably Abraham's name on some contract somewhere in, in Palestine maybe in Ur of the Chaldees, if you were looking in the right place. Um, that these are actually real people and the creation was a real event. Um, then I think there are some consequences that flow that are testable. And Frankly, that's where I got the idea of looking at carbon-14 in the way I did. It was, it was with specific reference to trying to understand carbon-14 has real data. How do you explain it from a creationist point of view? If you explain it that way, what are the differences between that creationist point of view and a standard model evolutionary long-age point of view? And... Uh, when I did that, there were three tests that popped out, and I wrote on them in my first article in Origins, specifically saying these are the things we need to test. And of course, when I wrote them, um, I had thought them a long time before I wrote them, um, and had been looking for some pieces of data. After that, I went after some uh, specific pieces of data, particularly looking at carbon-14 in very old material, and carbon-14, um, less carbon-14 than expected in uh, bones from the city of Nineveh. And both of those have come out, uh, let's say, easier to explain by uh, the theories that I was testing than by the standard model. Now, I don't want to just stop there. I say, well, let's keep testing this. Let's get some other materials from Nineveh and see if it follows the same pattern, for example. Um, and I, I think that it's worth our while to try to create material without carbon-14 in it at all, uh, run it through the standard tests, and see if we can beat the fossil material, 
And if we can do that, then it makes it harder to understand things from the standard model and easier to draw the conclusion that uh, a short age creationist model is a better explanation of things. I think that that same kind of procedure should be done on, on a whole bunch of other areas. I'd love to see, for example, the uh, Hema's uh, granodiorite experiment repeated elsewhere and see if it gives you the same results. Um, I think there are a whole bunch of things. Uh, I think that continually going back to the Grand Canyon and asking how do you model this from a short age perspective and from a long age perspective, going along and looking for signs of erosion in paraconformities. How much erosion do you have? What kinds of erosion? Uh, do you have soft sediment deformation? I think those are kinds of questions that ought to be asked, ought to be looked at, and the results ought to be published, and preferably, if one can do it, in the standard literature. Um, Leonard Brand, as I understand it right now, is working on a book which will outline creationist inspired research that has come to reasonable fruition. And I think that more of that will be helpful in answering the question of what do we do with all this, quote, overwhelming evidence, end quote as we start looking at it carefully and we find out that it's not as overwhelming as people thought and that there are experimental evidences for the reverse. Well, I, wasn't really talking about I wasn't really talking about um, what's overwhelming or not. I was just talking about the library where we get the data from. The library as in the book of Genesis, the room of the book of Genesis versus the room of the book of nature. Yes. You get you get tons of stuff in the room of, book of, of the book of nature and hardly anything in the book of Genesis. But there is that timeline there kind of puts a, a wrench in the whole thing, you know. So it makes it very, very, very um, hard to work that in with all the stuff in the book of nature. And that's what we're doing here. We're trying to, to make that happen. And... Um, and it's difficult. It's, it's pretty difficult. I'm not saying that it, it can't be done and just because it's difficult that it isn't that way, but, but um, I believe it can be done, like you, can, you believe it, that you know, all this stuff will harmonize somehow. Um, but, but what I was talking about was the library of data, you know, as far as, as, far as what you get out of Genesis versus what you get out of the book of nature. I, w I wasn't talking about something overwhelming, some idea overwhelming another idea. It was just, you know, this data, which um, isn't very much coming out of Genesis. Well, one of the things we're going to explore next week, we're going to talk about something that's been put up in the standard literature. And one of the things I hope that people come out uh, away from uh, doing it is don't believe all the press, press releases. In fact, I would go further and say, be careful about what you believe in the textbooks. You know, they still have Heckel's embryos in biology textbooks. Uh, people know about this. People know it's a controversy. People know that it's bad for their side when people find out that these are fraudulent and they've been taught them in high school biology. But they're still there in probably about half the textbooks that are out there. You know, it used to be 90 or 100 percent of it, the textbooks had them. Uh, so some of them, uh, Miller and Levine in particular, have kind of retracted it and substituted photos, which is a little more honest. Uh, but but you, you, have to, you have to get back to the original data. You, you cannot just simply take what's, what's in the, either the press releases or even in the textbooks without a generous dose of skepticism. And once you do that, you realize that it's not like they, we have seven bullets to fire and they have 7,000. That actually, 
at least half of their bullets are blanks. And half of them are firing in the wrong direction. And so, you know, at, at a certain point, it's not quite as impressive as you thought. And when you have the experience like I did of going into carbon-14 very carefully and noticing that, you know, uh, when I made these predictions and then went out to look at the data and, you know, uh, other people, by the way, did the tests. I didn't even do the tests themselves. All I did was goad them into doing it. Well, and in some cases, give them money to do it. Um, <laughs> uh, that when that happened, uh, you know, the results come out in my favor. Well, you know, at some point you start saying, well, maybe it isn't quite as impressive as it's cracked up to be. Uh, I just wanted to mention. Uh, are we are we, we out we, of uh, power or something? I don't know. Is this not working? It's not working, no. Okay, just go ahead. And <laughs> say it uh, loudly so we can hear. Okay. Uh, I think we need to keep in in mind uh, the the broader picture of the influence of paradigms, and the broader picture of the strength of materialistic philosophy. Uh, I think we are all happier with materialistic data. I shouldn't say we all are. Some of us are happier. You know, hey, what I can see, I, I, I trust more than uh, hearsay or uh, my feelings type of thing. I, I think we tend to have a little more confidence in that. And I think this uh, stimulates uh, scientists to stay in the materialist realm where they feel a little more confident. Uh, it is a severe restriction of logic to say that all truth lies there. Uh, in fact, you, the materialistic data, such as the origin of life, tells us very clearly this does not work. There's something beyond our ordinary materialistic understanding. Uh, so in this broader picture, of, sometimes we might say the great controversy, and the broader picture of uh, uh, the paradigm dominance of materialism now in science, which is not so a couple of centuries ago, uh, and so on, uh, the, the literature is definitely biased against God, against creation, uh, the Bible, and so on. Uh, but it, it's explainable uh, if you're willing to uh, consider that, in general, uh, the dominant paradigm at present is materialistic. It's uh, science. Uh, it goes by matter, and it's too simple to answer reality. Uh, and I uh, think we need to keep that picture in mind that uh, uh, and science changes its viewpoints. It used to think, you know, hey, you think continents move around? That was a silly idea. Now, if you don't believe the continents move around, oh, well, you're, you're not a scientist. Uh, so we need to keep that broad picture in mind. And the, and the science went from one to the other within five years. Um, I, you know, I, I'm going to say I'm a materialist, too. I, I, I mean, I, I trust things that I have experienced more than things that somebody else has told me. Um, and that's one of the reasons why uh, carbon-14 to me is so important, is because it's something that I personally experienced. Um, I, I imagine that in your case, when you were looking at soft sediment deformation after the, the two uh, layers are se separated by six million years or whatever, that that... Uh, that gives you more confidence in a shorter chronology. Um, and the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, all of us are affected by that. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's important for us not to just try to stand on our own, but to also look at the researches not only of long age people, but the researches of short age people, or the researches that, that argue for short age. Uh, we can't simply keep bombarding ourselves with facts on one side of a debate uh, 
and expect us to be able to handle the debate well. Um, and that's one of the reasons we have this class is so that uh, uh, those of you who don't get to see this kind of thing all the time can look at the work of people who have done experiments like this and have had things come out. Uh, you know, I'm thinking in particular of, uh, right now of Clyde Webster and his uranium roll front deposits, which were thought to take millions of years and now can be documented to take uh, nine months or so. You know, when you see those things, you begin to experience things differently. And I would even go so far as to say that that's true for Christianity as well. And that is why when, when uh, uh, Jesus invites, uh, or God invites, taste and see that the Lord is good, um, that is why it's important to have a personal experience uh, with Jesus in, you know, of your own. That it makes a lot more difference to do that than it does to have heard of all the wonderful experiences that other people have had. Because when it happens to you, it gets personalized. And one can argue that, well, we should be able to do this all intellectually, but that's not the way we're built. And, you know, you can argue whether it's a bug or a feature, but it's life and you've got to deal with it. And I, I think that in that case, it's important for us to deal with it. Uh, this needs to be part of our own experience. You know, if you're dealing with science, I think that it's important to go out, do the best work you can, but to go out and actually test some of these things so that you do get a, a feel for whether they really hold up or not. Uh, comment here? Yeah, um, I think there's a lot to be said for the power of suggestion. When uh, evolutionists for many years seem to have had born sway, at least by, with the large public at large, then it appears more and more that all the evidence is turning in their direction. You know, they've, they've made the suggestion and it gets in your mind. And what you're just talking about is, is just a wonderful antidote to that. And um, because God, Ellen White says that God uh, has left many evidences, if we'll look with an open mind to in nature to, that reveals his character and, and the, the truths of the Bible. So I think, I wonder if a lot of these questions that are piled, so supposedly piled up against the Bible is like a house of cards. But if you've never seen the house of cards tumble, you think it's solid forever. Right, exactly. It looks solid. You know, just to take an example, um, plate tectonics was originally a creationist theory. A lot of people don't know that, <laughs> right? Uh, it, um, people were dead set against it in the standard geologic community. And it was almost one year that flipped everything, certainly five years. Uh, it, it, you, went to, you went to a convention, everybody's poo-pooing the idea, and, and, you know, Next year you come in and, uh, well, this is the new in thing. And five years later, if you don't believe it, you're just, you know, hopelessly behind the times. Uh, this happens. It happens in all kinds of areas of life. It happened in uh, Eastern Europe. When I can remember when people were saying that, you know, communism would last for decades at least. And then six weeks later, it was gone. And when you've seen a few of those things happen, you start to realize that what we think is solid isn't as solid as what we think it is. And we have to be really careful about putting our faith in things that aren't really that solid. Amen. Uh, one, one last comment, and uh, I think we'll close it. Okay, I have uh, several things to mention, very brief. Uh, Moses, it is true that Moses talked to God face to face. Now, 
The strange thing is that in spite of the fact that in the rest of the books of Moses, it is repeated again and again and again that God told Moses this, God told Moses that, and he recorded. But in Genesis, in Genesis it doesn't. there's no record, there's no credit given to the source of the information. That's now, not, my suggestion... That's not true. You should have been here last you week. You should have been here last week. Well, we discussed that Moses, in fact, probably had records and that this is the story of the heavens and the earth was the story that was passed on and that Moses had it in probably in written form. And that, and that uh, uh, I mean, uh, you know, obviously we're not there so we can't say for absolute dead sure, but the indications are that, that, that these were written up in a form that had catchphrases on it and it had colophons on it and that were the standard way of scribally re writing this stuff. And that, so we had the tablet of the heavens and the earth, we had the tablet of man or of Adam, we have the tablet of Noah, we have the tablet of Noah's three sons, we have the tablet of Shem, we have the tablet of Terah. So uh, we have the tablet of Isaac and of, and of Ishmael and of um, Jacob. Jacob and Esau. So these were probably written up what and I'm so, saying. And, and so in that case, the reason Moses didn't say he talked to the Lord directly is because he had the records. And the records in the case of the heavens and the earth probably came from the mouth of God himself. What I'm saying is that there is no attribution in the book of Genesis to the source from which he got the story. I, I agree with you with what you said. I was not here, but I'm in perfect agreement with what you're saying. Uh, I always believe that Moses did have some records, but the, the interesting thing is that in the book of Genesis, when he wrote the story, he did not say, okay, God told me no. this is what happened. That's my point. Now, I, I'd like to mention something else. Uh, there was a reference to the fact that uh, you know we we uh, the elements we find on Earth are similar to what comes in sp from space. Now, what happened? We don't know what happened when Lucifer rebelled. We always think this was a psychological war, a war of words, but we don't know. There might have been uh, attempts by Lucifer to destroy some of the things that God had created. And maybe what we see in space that does not make, make sense, maybe it's the result of an actual physical battle between Lucifer and God. That you're suggesting the asteroids might be part of an exploded planet. Um, uh, well, that's in the standard scientific literature is a suggestion. So, uh, you know, it's not totally off the wall. Isn't it wonderful? One day we'll find out for sure. It is.